Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here. My name is Joe Donahue. I am the Associate Pastor of Maintenance here on the church campus. So uh, I'm just delighted to be here. I had a, a wrench in my hand, and Pastor Chad said, hey, you're supposed to preach. And I said, oh, okay. I'm just kidding. I am really excited as we talk about, or as we continue to talk about the Ten Commandments uh, tonight to get to talk about the Sixth Commandment. Thou shalt not murder. I, I think if there's one of the Ten Commandments that I don't feel convicted about when I stand up in front of the church, it's because I've never murdered anyone. So we, I have uh, the Ten Commandments, and, and I'm, man, I feel uh, guilty. I, I know I've taken the Lord's name in vain at times. I feel guilty about not resting on the Sabbath. I feel guilty about maybe not honoring my father and mother. I feel guilty. I missed one in there somewhere. Uh, but I, then we get to uh, the Sixth Commandment. Thou shalt not murder. I'm like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Yay. I think we'd all agree, as we look at our sermon series, Guardrails, if we want our lives to not crash, we follow the Ten Commandments, because that's the way that God has established. He, we're, we don't get to heaven through the Ten Commandments. We don't get to heaven by keeping them. We get to heaven through Jesus. He's our, he's our grace. He's our doorway to heaven. But the Ten Commandments are there to help keep our lives from crashing. And I think we would all agree that if we break that commandment, thou shalt not murder— we will crash our life pretty quickly, won't we? We'll end up in jail, we'll end up in prison, we'll end up something like that. So our life will definitely spin out of control. Now, traditionally, this commandment is understood as uh, thou shalt not kill. And you would be surprised that there is actually some, uh, some people argue using thou shalt not kill as a reason why maybe we shouldn't go to war or maybe why we, uh, we shouldn't have the death penalty. But that verse is often misunderstood and, mis, uh, and uh, uh, not translated correctly. In 1611, in the King James Version, that word was translated kill instead of how it actually is, which is murder. Uh, it doesn't make sense if it's killed because we'd run into immediate problems because God desires that uh, he actually commands war at times, which we know what happens in war. People die, and God would be guilty of sinning if this was, and breaking his own commandment if this was thou shalt not kill. So what does this commandment actually mean? In the original Hebrew language, the word involves premeditation and personal reasons to take another person's life premeditation and personal reasons to take another's life. So God is not guilty of breaking the Ten Commandments. A kindergarten teacher was explaining to her class uh, the Ten Commandments, and she was walking them through, and she talked about honoring your father and mother, and she said, are there any other commandments uh, that would relate to your siblings? And one of the boys spoke up, and he said, thou shalt not murder. So help me out a little bit here tonight. What I'd like for you to do is I would like for you to raise your hand if you murdered anybody yesterday. Whoa! Okay. <laughs> Make sure our security detail is... Uh... How about if you murdered anyone last year? Anyone murder anybody last year? How, <laughs> how about... <laughs> now I'm really getting nervous. <laughs> raise your hand if you... Um... Raise your hand if you never murdered anybody, but you kind of wanted to. Okay, we, we would probably all fall into that category a little bit more. Now, I have never murdered anybody. However, I am grateful that we do have a redeeming God, don't we? We have a God who does give second chances and third chances and offers forgiveness and mercy, even to what we would think would be the worst sin possible. But God offers second chances. Think about uh, there was a man in the New Testament named Saul who would order the death of Christians, yet he was forgiven and he was transformed and he was radically changed by the life-changing power of the gospel, so much so that he became an apostle. And we have most of the New Testament as a result of what God did in his life. God does redeem and forgive. So the question is this, why did God give the command to not murder? Have you ever thought about that? Why is it that God gives us this commandment to not murder one another? 
Well, first, I want to give you two reasons. First is this, because number one, we are made in the image of God. We have been made, I want you to think about that. We've been made in his image. You know, when I wake up in the morning and I go and I look in the mirror, I see my reflection. I see the image of what I look like. We have been made in the image of God. We are his image bearers. Genesis 1.27 says, uh, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. You should find very, uh, a great amount of joy in knowing that you have been made in God's image. All humans have been made in God's image. All people everywhere have been stamped with God's image. Whether it's the homeless person that you pass on the street, whether it's the guy that cuts you off in traffic, they have been made in the very image of God. There is nothing like us on all the planet. There's nothing in all of creation that bears God's image, but human beings bear his image. When God looks upon humankind, he sees his image. God desires that we don't murder one another because then we're destroying the image of God reflected in the life of that person that has been created in God's image. Which takes us to the second reason that God gave the command not to murder, which is the human body is the greatest creation of God. Ephesians 2.10 says we are God's masterpiece. Now, this may not be politically correct. This may sound like a, a high and mighty, you know, guy talking about how we are, uh, we are God's masterpiece. I, I want you to understand there is nothing in all of creation as great as a human being. Uh, there's nothing. We are the very best of God's creation. Well, how do we know that? God desires a personal relationship with who? The mountains, the Grand Canyon, the, the trees, the sky, the galaxies, the stars, the, the, the animals. No, God desires that personal relationship with you. You are the very best of God's creation. As beautiful as Lake Havasu is, we love it. It's astounding. It is beautiful. The palm trees and the blue sky and the water. It's just, it's absolutely breathtaking. But there is nothing in all creation like another human being. We are the greatest creation that God has ever made. The person sitting beside you is the greatest is the greatest example of God's creation. The person in front of you is the greatest example of God's creation. Wouldn't it be funny if we were like visitors uh, to the Grand Canyon? You know, the visitors to the Grand Canyon, they can pull up with their camera and they're snapping pictures. Wouldn't it be so amazing if we had such an appreciation for the awe and beauty of God's creation in one another that we're actually camped out outside each other's houses taking pictures, you know? <laughs> I guess that sounds a little like stalking, doesn't it? <laughs> so don't do that. But, but we, should, we should know and understand how beautiful how amazing we are. There's nothing in all creation like us. Nothing. I know that we're blown away when we see pictures of NASA, when we see uh, from NASA of the, of the galaxies, of the stars, of the universe, of the cosmos. It's breathtaking. Yet there's no one, nothing in all creation that the Son of God would give his life for but us. We've been made in his image, and as human beings, we are the very best of God's creation. Sermon today, the sermon today is not intended to persuade you to not murder. Uh, we know that in 2017, there were 17,284 murders in the United States. The population of the USA is roughly 326 million at the time. So there's about a 1% chance we would actually commit murder. Or is there? Or is there? When Jesus came on the scene in the New Testament, he immediately turned the tables on the Pharisees, didn't he? That what did the Pharisees want to do? The Pharisees wanted to correct the actions of other people. 
That's what the Pharisees wanted to do. They, were, they, were more cons- they wanted to please God, but they wanted to please God by correcting the actions of others. They were all concerned about the actions of others. Now, Jesus was concerned about the actions of others when he came on the scene, but he was more concerned about the attitude of the heart or just as concerned about the attitude of the heart. In other words, Jesus, the, the Pharisees would teach not to murder, but they didn't teach anything about hating or hatred of somebody else. It was, it was okay to well up, have those feelings of anger and hatred welling up in one's heart and want to murder somebody, but Jesus was more concerned or just as concerned with whether or not somebody really wanted to murder someone. Not, I mean, he, his actions, the actions of the individual matter just as much. So Jesus taught us that God wants us to act right on the outside and be right on the inside. That's what Jesus was concerned about. Not only acting right, but being right. Wouldn't we all agree that we can do the right thing, but our hearts aren't right with God? We would all agree that we can do and say we could show up to church, we could lift our hands and worship and have hearts that were far from him. Remember what Jesus said about how people who worship him, they worship him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. Jesus is more or just as concerned about the heart as he is about our actions. God's not just interested in whether we would murder. He's more concerned about whether you would murder if you could murder. If you could and get away with it, would you do it? Jesus said in Matthew 5, 21 through 22, You've heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder, If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Jesus said that I am just as guilty of murdering somebody if I'm harboring anger in my heart toward them. If I'm hanging on to that anger... If, it's, if it overwhelms in my heart, I am as guilty of murder. I'm not as innocent as murder of murder as I thought I was. God wants me to act right on the outside, but to be right on the inside. I, I've lived 45 years without ever having been tempted to murder somebody. And chances are, by God's grace, I will live another 45 years without that temptation But I, as I think about the heart of the command to not murder, I realize that there are many ways in which I am guilty of committing murder. And if I could, I'd like to share those with you. There are three ways that I break the heart of the command not to murder. The first is murder, choosing murder for entertainment. Now, I am certainly not going to preach against television or preach against violence on TV. I think that's something that we've all heard about all throughout our lives. It's virtually impossible to find any type of action movie on television or any, uh, anything that you would see in the, in the theater where somebody is not murdered, where somebody is not killed, they're not shot, they're stabbed, they're murdered, they're decimated, decapitated. If you were to scroll through my Netflix account, you would see movies and movies after shows after shows of violence and, and, and movies where people are murdering one another. God calls murder a sin And I reflect on my life and I see that I'm entertained by something that God calls sin. God calls murder a sin and I'm entertained by it. One night we tucked our girls into bed and went downstairs and I was a big fan of The Walking Dead. I probably, you know, not so much anymore, not because I think it's wrong. It's just, yeah, the show's changed a little bit, okay? Killing off all the good characters. So... I went to, uh, we went downstairs to watch Walking Dead, and I'm watching it, and we're about 45 minutes into the show, and if you know anything about Walking Dead, that's when all the crazy stuff is happening, all the killing is going on, and I jumped up because my daughter Sophie was standing right beside me. I said, oh no, oh no, turn off the TV. Uh, you know, she's about five years old at the time. I said, Sophie, did you, did you see anything on TV? She said, I saw it when that man with the mustache stuck that other man in the head with a knife. Parenting fail, right? 
That was a parenting fail. It was like a failure moment. Do you know that if a child watches three to four hours of television a day, by the time they uh, hit kindergarten, uh, they have seen over, I think that's the right, I want to make sure that's the right, uh, by the time they finish grade school, they will have seen about 8,000 murders on television. We turn on the television in the morning to watch the news, and we always have to turn it off because they're talking about somebody being murdered, somebody being killed. Now, I'm not saying that I don't watch movies with killing and murder in them, but the reality is Hollywood knows what entertains us. Hollywood, Hollywood knows what we are fascinated with. Hollywood knows what we are going to want to watch. We're entertained by something that God calls a sin. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the show Snapped. Anyone familiar with the show Snap? Raise your hand if you're familiar. Okay, now this is where it gets crazy. My sister-in-law watches Snap, and I'm always worried about my wife watching it with her. So Snapped is about a woman who finally, and it's about a series of women, just women everywhere, who finally get fed up with their husband, and they kill him. <laughs> and it's a reality-based show. So I always get nervous whenever my wife starts watching that show with my sister-in-law. I'm like, eh. Honey, let's pray together tonight before we go to bed. <laughs> the self-examining question I ask myself is this. If I am okay with fictional murder, will I become okay with fictional adultery? If I'm okay with fictional uh, murder, will I become okay with fictional idolatry? Maybe fictional language that takes the Lord's name in vain. Sadly, I have found myself being entertained by something that God hates. But thankfully, I'm discovering that I want to be entertained by those things less. Philippians 4.8, Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's anything of virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I want to meditate on the things are good and helpful for me more so secondly how else could i break the heart of the command not to murder i think it's valuing life by my own standard valuing life by my standard that i set the value of life psalm 139 15 through 16 tells us that god watched us as we were being formed in the womb he watched us grow while we were woven together in utter seclusion and that he saw us before we were born and that the days of our life were written out before him before even one of them began do i value life like god does there's a story about a little girl who had a pet turtle and the pet turtle died and we know how little girls are with any type of pet the pet turtle died and she was brokenhearted and she cried and she wept and the mom couldn't console her and the dad came home and he knew what had happened and she was so brokenhearted about this turtle and he said, I'll go to the pet store and we'll buy another one. And she said, no, and she started crying even harder. So dad wanting to fix the situation and wanting to, the little girl just to stop crying, he said, I know what? It was like an epiphany moment. I know what we'll do. We will throw a funeral party. We will get jumpy houses and we're going to get food and we're going to invite all the neighborhood kids out and we're going to have a great celebration and it's going to be wonderful. And at the end of all of our fun, all of our excitement, all of our music and all of our partying, then we'll take the turtle and put him in a box and put him in the ground in the backyard. And the little girl cheered up. She got excited. She started thinking about the jumpy houses and the water slides and all the fun stuff that they were going to have at the party. And as she looked down, little turtle started to move. And they were kind of shocked and she saw her dreams of the party going away and she looked up at her daddy real quick and said, Daddy, kill it. <laughs> she valued life until life was going to ruin her party. I think we do the same thing so often. We value life until it becomes an inconvenience. We value life unless it gets in the way of our party. In today's culture, it's estimated that 55 million babies have been killed through abortion since 1973. Every year, almost 1 million babies are aborted. And often it's because they get in the way of somebody's party. 
they become an inconvenience. You've seen all the news stories that have been out recently in regard to abortion. I'm just so grateful that God is a God who redeems. You know what I love? I love to hear stories about people, women who maybe had an abortion when they were younger and now they're working in life resources centers and they're talking and they're counseling with women and they're encouraging them not to go through with an abortion. I'm so grateful that, that women and men have experienced God's forgiveness in their lives when they have said, yeah, let's go ahead and get this. And they've had a change of heart afterwards and realized it was wrong, that God does bring healing and God does bring uh, restoration. I'm so grateful for that. But we have to remember and value as followers of Jesus, we have to value life and see it the way that God sees life. Not only the unborn, but what about those who are already born? What about the men and women who are homeless that we see? What about the neighbors that's walking through a difficult time with their spouse and just want somebody to talk to? What about the husband or the wife that feel like their marriage is over? Do we value life enough to reach out with a word of consolation? Do we value life enough to reach out with a word of prayer? Do I value life enough to stop what I'm doing and get involved in the life of others? See, if we really did value and cherish life, we would. We'd be available. We'd minister. We, we'd care that, that not just about the people having water in Kenya, but the people across the street in need of water standing at the intersection. We care about those who are thirsty and those who are hungry, those who are homeless, those who are in prison, those who are broken. We value them the way God does. And the third way I think that I break the heart of the command not to murder is by allowing anger and bitterness or anger and unforgiveness to grow deep roots in my heart. First John writes about uh, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel were two sons of Adam and Eve. They were uh, brothers, and apparently Cain had some major anger issues toward Abel. They each presented an offering. They each presented a sacrifice to God. Abel's was rejected, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, Cain's was rejected, and Abel's was accepted. And it's because, as first as John tells us, God could see what was going on in Cain's heart. He could see that while he was presenting this offering, while he was presenting the sacrifice, he had some deep anger built up against his brother. In First John three, John wrote. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. See, Cain allowed anger and jealousy to consume his heart. So his deeds were evil. Sin leads to sin. God wants us to love the people that have been made in his image. When we hang on to the junk that bothers us about people, we're, we're moving down that slippery slope toward hatred. And hatred in God's eyes is just as bad as murdering them. So how do we prevent our lives from crashing? How do we prevent our lives from, from going outside the guardrails and ruining our lives? How do we prevent uh, our lives from doing that? How do we prevent anger in my heart to grow into hate and become guilty of murder? Well, I want you to, first of all, know this. You can make it right between myself or make it right between yourself and God. So I'm so grateful that we have a God that forgives. As I even talked about hatred or talked about unforgiveness, more than likely there are people in your life that you've encountered that you need to clear the air with. And you know that. But first and foremost, take it to God. First John 1, 9, uh, uh, God writes or, or John writes, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness you can just go to god and say god I, I gotta admit that i am very angry and i'm bitter and i'm unforgiving toward this individual will you help me i acknowledge it's a sin will you help me secondly do your part to make it right or do my part to make it right with myself and fill in the blank who is it out there right now that you're upset with write their name down 
go to them talk to them romans 12 18 says if possible so far as it depends on you live peaceably with all is there somebody that you need to go to is it a spouse is it a child is it a grandchild is it a neighbor is there somebody that you need to go to and just say hey i want to clear the air i, I don't want to have this anger in my heart towards you any longer or it's going to them and saying the words i was wrong I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Now, those three words are hard to say. I was wrong, aren't they? And so we're gonna, I want you to repeat it after me, all right? Because we all know I was wrong is hard. It's like we start to say, and we go, I wrote that high. Let me tell you the you know? We, we can't get those words out of our mouth because of our stubborn pride. So we're all gonna say it together. I was wrong. No, that's good. Let's do it again. One, two, three. I was wrong. That's good. I am sorry. Will you forgive me? Now, oftentimes we'll hit those first two, but we don't go that, that third option. We don't include the will you forgive me because we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid that they'll say no, but it's so needed. Asking people to forgive us. And then thirdly, how do we keep our lives from crashing? Trust that the most vile murder that has ever been committed is the murder of the Son of God. It's the murder of Jesus who took my place. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. See, Jesus just simply didn't die on the cross. That murder that man committed was planned by God to give us life. Jesus forgave us for our sins. He received in himself the penalty for your and my sin. The murder, the anger, the hatred, whatever it is that you're guilty of, Jesus has paid the price. It was through his murder that we have eternal life. Trust in that. And you say, how do I trust in that? You know, a few moments ago that we said, I was wrong. A lot of people not only have a hard time saying, I was wrong to one another but they have a hard time saying father i was wrong and that's what sin is sin is just simply wrong it's acknowledging to god that we have been living life our own way and it's going to him and saying father i was wrong i am sorry will you forgive me i accept jesus as my savior if you can bring yourself to say something like that to god he will forgive you he will restore you and you will be a new creation if you have somebody that you want if you have a a question about that or if you want to talk to somebody tonight i want to encourage you to stop by the welcome center i'll be out there the connection center i'll be out there i'd love to meet with you i'd love to talk with you i'd love to pray with you but even more so There'll be prayer counselors down at the front after we participate in communion and they will be here and they will be available if you would like to come down and say, I'm ready to tell God I was wrong and I'm sorry and ask him to forgive me. If you want to do that, you will be made a new creation. Let's pray together. Father, I want to say thank you Thank you that, that Jesus was, was murdered on the cross for my behalf. I, I can't imagine what that was like. I, I can't imagine what he went through as he paid the penalty for my sin and the sins of the people of the world. But God, we thank you that we are a people who have been made in your image. We thank you, Father, that we are a people, that there is nothing like us in all of creation, that we bear your image and there's nothing else in all of creation that you would give your life for and that you want to have a relationship with. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving your life for us and paying the price for our sins. Jesus, thank you. I ask God tonight that if you've been speaking to someone in here about giving their life to Jesus, experience, experiencing life change through the power of the gospel, Lord, that tonight 
today would be the day they would hear your voice and give their life to you. Lord, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.